already queued up. I just want to make sure the sound is good and we give it a second and we will be rolling. Last time we had over, I think our record was a little over 800 people at one at one point. Let's see if we can uh, do better today. It is a cold day out here in the house. It is 20 degrees out this morning. Is this better? Let's uh, microphone a little closer. Sound is quiet. Sounds very quiet. Sound can go up. I don't think the mic's working. All right, we're on it. We're on it. We'll get it fixed here in a second. All right, now how is? Helps a little. Still not loud enough. It sounds like the table mic is off and they're using the built-in mic on the front. All right, we're on it. We're on it, just give me a second. This one here. This. Try turning the mic up. Don't go anywhere. I have lots of good stuff covered. Tap the mic to see if we hear it. Did you hear that? We're on the sound. When you tap the mic, there's no sound, so it's probably not connected. Can't hear. The mic needs creatine. Not working. I don't hear, no sound, no sound, no sound. Okay, John, your mic, you can't hear. All right, let me, um, all right, is that better? Is this better? It works, boom! Holy crap, I jumped. Boom! For those of you wearing headphones, Crank them up all the way. <laughs> all right. Very good. A little too loud now. Oh, come on. Picky, picky, picky. All right, let's try this again. Now, is that perfect? All right. Is that better? Better? Okay. A little loud. Come on. This is why I stopped doing the Choose Your Own Video Workout series because people were complaining that it was too hard to understand. Um, okay, we will go ahead and get started now. Just want to give you a little update. Uh, what's going on? Uh, what's going on in the life of the Meadows family? And then I want to get to all your questions. It's been, um, I think, three weeks since we did one of these. We've been trying to do one every about three weeks. So um, I don't really have any health updates. Uh, I, well, I'm trying to think. Um, trying to think when okay i do have a health update for you so after our last live i went to see dr serrano for just a normal visit and <clears throat> there's this thing called the point of or wait a minute what's the pmi not the kind where it's house insurance point of maximal impulse 
So the point of maximal impulse as it relates to your heart. And so what that is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's this point when they have their little stethoscope on you and they're listening to your heartbeat. The point that is the loudest uh, on your heart is the point of maximal impulse. Now, here's why that's important. Normally, it's in your left ventricle, specifically down around the apex of your left ventricle. And I did not have that. I had no detectable beat there at all because that tissue, if you remember, the doctor had told me that it essentially died, the first doctor, and it wasn't coming back. So it was gloom and doom. And Dr. Serrano, when they were, he examined me a couple weeks ago, he smiled and he said, your PMI is back in your left ventricle. I didn't know what PMI was at the time. I hadn't heard that term before. So I said, what does my house insurance have to do with my heart? And he said, no, it's the point of maximum impulse and it's back in your left ventricle. It's moved from your right ventricle over to your left ventricle. That means it's working again. So <clears throat> how much is it working? I don't know. But what I do know is that's a good sign. That's a very good sign that there's some cardiac remodeling there in my, um, in my heart uh, where it was damaged. And that's a very good thing. So I'm very happy about that. I am happy to uh, fill you in on that. And um, Dr. Serrano was very happy. He had a couple other people come in and to see what they would find. They found the same thing. So um, it would appear that um, there is some remodeling in my heart that is very good. And I've been training, as you've seen, normally. Like I don't have any restrictions. Um, this week was an exciting week. I even got a little sunburn. We had a football camp on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So we had about 90 campers uh, show up for this football camp. And uh, it's in the city here, it's uh, spring break. So the kids were able to come out. We had an awesome, awesome, awesome football camp. I am super, super excited uh, for the season to start. Still got a little ways, um, but it was good to see the kids. And uh, I am very, very, very excited about that. Um, next week, we're going on vacation. We're going to be in uh, Orlando, Florida with the family, trying to have a little bit of fun and relax and chill out. I've been working really, really, really hard. So what have I, what have I been working on? Well, I think everybody must have heard by now, but um, Dave Tate and I have been working on a power builder program that I think would be a really, really good program. We've been working on this for a long time. It would have been done. It would have been done a long time ago. If it wasn't for uh, COVID, kind of sh- that was loud. COVID kind of shutting down the gyms, so you will um, see that we're just having the cover built right now, and then we've got to get the um, we've just got to get it formatted into the PDF document. But we've already the program is done; it's coming. I'm hoping that when I get back from vacation, it's it's formatted. So we're almost there. Just give us a couple more weeks. The program, I think. You're going to love it. And um, so I'm very, very excited about that. That's one of the things I've been working on. Um, If you haven't seen Avalanche, we launched that program. Maybe that was just a program that I wrote. That was about six, seven weeks ago. That one has been doing great. Everybody's loving it. Most people that did it are asking me if they can do it again, and they're they're repeating it and doing it again. So that's pretty much where I'm at right now. A lot of clients that are getting ready for the Olympia, Uh, Missy's coming back to defend her title. Terrence is coming back to hopefully take the title. And um, Sean Clarita has been putting in a lot of work as well, Um, you know, with the training program. He actually just messaged me yesterday. And um, I've got some newcomers to the team that I think think have a great shot at making the Olympia. Hopefully you guys saw my video with Dr. Sonny Andrew. She's down in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. I think she's got a great shot at making the Olympia in the wellness division. And um, got a girl named Brooke Walker in women's physique. That's phenomenal. I think she's got a great shot. I've been working with Samson uh, over there in England. Uh, he's about he was about 308 pounds two weeks ago, looking really good. So I think I think we've got uh, we're going to have a good team at the Olympia this year. So I'm really excited about that as well. Um, and I've been doing football clinics. If I have any spare time, football clinics. So it's been nonstop here. So I'm really looking forward to uh, getting to Florida. All right, so let me get into your questions here. I, I know there's a lot queued up. I'll do the best I can. Uh, let me just kind of scroll back up to the top through all these. I, I see Europe's under quarantine again, and I um, I actually just got a message from one of my clients saying that India was shut down again. 
Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. I don't even know what to say to that. Uh, the gyms are pretty much open here. And, um, and I, 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 I can't imagine how frustrated you must be. So um, hang in there, and hopefully people will get some sense. Um, very, very disappointing to see that. So here's a question from Joe. How would training, dieting, and lifestyle differ differ if you coached a client who wants to look and feel their best versus one with competitive bodybuilding goals? It's actually more similar than you would think. It's just one is not as extreme as the other. So if I'm working with someone, by the way, probably half the people I work with don't even compete. Um, they're going to follow the same principles to be lean and feel healthy and feel great. But they don't have to go to that that last distance, the last at the end, getting ultra, ultra lean. Like, you know, for a guy getting down a four or five percent body fat is very, very painful. It's hard to do um, if it's a real four or five percent body fat. I know there's people out there claiming they're three percent, but they're more, probably more like eight or nine percent. Um, so, you know, the competitors do that, too. They get down to seven or eight percent, but then they just keep on going down to four or five percent. And that's where it gets painful. So the only difference really is it's just not as extreme. Um, so what I would typically do with a bodybuilder is build in, you know, food that they enjoy. You know, I do the 90-10 rule per that video I did, some fun food as well. I do, would do the same thing with someone who doesn't compete. I want them to enjoy their meals. I don't look at meals as strictly fuel. I look at meals as something that um, can help. You know, if you look at different cultures, their families, and their friends and how people get together to share a meal together. Food is more than just fuel. It's a way to um, get together as a family, to break bread together, for friends to get together, to have a good time. So there's social significance and happiness you can get out of having good meals together. It's not just food is fuel. You know, if you want to be a robot and think that way, that's fine. That's just not the way I think. Um, if you want to do that, that's fine though. So it's just not as extreme. Um, that's the only difference. You, you got to push it to the next level when you compete, and you don't need to do that when you don't compete. In fact, you don't want to do that if you don't compete because then you'll feel miserable. Getting com competitive lean, getting like shredded, is not a pleasant experience. When I think of how I felt the, the worst, it's when I was the leanest. And anybody who's really good in this sport will tell you when you get to that level of leanness, you do not feel good. You don't have a lot of energy, you don't feel good. So it's just a temporary state to compete in, and then you want to get out of that. And that's why after a contest, I bring people's calories back up so much so quickly. There's no need to stay in that lean and because it's really an unhealthy state to get that lean. A lot of times you don't even have um, you don't even have uh, fat around your organs to protect them. So I'd rather people as quickly as they can get back up to a healthy body fat percentage. Um, everything's going to be optimal. Your hormones will be better. Your joints will feel better. You'll be stronger. You'll feel more energy. So hopefully that answers your questions. Okay. Shang asked, what are my opinion on my reps from, uh, Borge? Um, he's a great dude. He actually used to be a client of, client of mine, maybe, oh man, maybe 10 years ago. Great guy. Love him. Um, yeah, I think the my reps are great. Um, I think I, I got to make sure I, I remember what my reps are, but I believe that he'll do reps to failure and then maybe rest and get some more reps to failure, kind of like what I call um, cluster sets. I think it's a very similar principle to that, and I, I think it's fantastic. I think it's great, and I think it's a way to get a lot of hard reps in, and once you get past the beginner and intermediate stages, so once you kind of hit that – advanced stage, those hard reps, the number of hard reps you do are absolutely what make the most difference. It's provided your form is good and your technique is good, it becomes how many hard reps are you doing? Um, so I like it. All right. Uh, what else we got here? A whole line of stuff. For peak week, how would you typically dry your athletes out? I know they're all different. Do you think cutting water 24 hours is good or not? So you're right, everybody's different. So I'm sorry I can't provide you with a pat answer. Here's how you treat every single person. <laughs> if someone tells you that, it's very bad advice um, to treat everybody the same way. But there's some general things that I like. First of all, if you don't have your athlete really lean, you can do whatever you want with your water. It's not going to help. 
In fact, if you cut water, they're going to look even worse. So um, the first order of business has to be to get. Well, how much water makes up muscle? Was it 60%, 70%? It would become obvious that if you completely drain someone of liquid, that they would have a lot of what we call being flat. So the muscle was not volumized. It's not pushing against the skin. When the muscle was not pushing against the skin, it doesn't show all the definition. So then people say, well, I don't see all the definition. He didn't. He didn't, must not have dieted hard enough. He's still fat. No, he just overdid water depletion. So he looks fat. He's really just flat. And then, of course, they eat, they drink. And two days later, they start posting their pictures on Instagram. They go, look how great I look now two days later. I mean, isn't that what we see with, with competitors 90% of the time? Um, I was one of those guys. I've, I've made all the mistakes myself. So I don't like to do big water depletion. I do like to bring water down, you know, 20% the day before a show. But I like to drive people out more with reducing their carbs the day before a show. Um, so then you're probably wondering, well, how do you carb load them? Well, I don't really load them, but I give them extra carbs two days before the show. Um, so that they got plenty of glycogen in your muscles in a day before your show, you're relaxing, so you're not burning it all out. And that seems to be a pretty solid method uh, for me. And that's, that's a, you know, obviously you tweak it for each person, but um, that's a lot of what I do. Okay, I had a message from Fred who retracted it, so I'm going to keep on going. Oh, okay. Thank you, Fred. Appreciate it. Um, I cussed you. Thank you for the support. Hope you have a good day as well. Sir, um, greetings, coach. Is there a chance we'll see you as an official commentator on the Mr. O live stream? <laughs> no one's ever asked me to do that. I mean, if you want me to, ask them. I think me and Fouad would be pretty good at that together. So you'll have to ask those guys. Put some pressure on them. Um, just showing love and support. Josh McGee, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, let's see here. Let me go down here. Paula, I see you sent one in. I'm just scrolling down. I've got, I'm scrolling down to probably 100, 200 messages down to try to find yours. Okay. Um, okay. Hi, John. What are the best carbs and protein sources for post-workout if I eat a pre-workout meal and have a scoop of EAA during the workout? Well, um, that's a great question. It doesn't need to be fast acting. It doesn't need to be super, it doesn't need to be a liquid carb and a liquid protein, a shake. If you want to do that, that's fine. More power to you. If you want to go to Smoothie King and get a smoothie, or if you want to use our granite protein, which actually tastes a lot better than the Smoothie King, um, go for it. But it, you've already had your pre-workout meal and some intra, so don't rush. What I tell people is take your time, go home and eat a balanced meal. I'd rather you see you eat uh, a filet and some rice or maybe some ground turkey and sweet potato, just a, a good balanced meal, some fat, some carbs, some protein from good sources. Don't think that you have to, a lot of people say you don't want any fat after a post-workout meal. You want everything to work fast. Fat will slow down, slow everything down real fast. Well, no, you've had your intro and you've had your pre-workout meal, so you're fine. Just take your time. Have a good, healthy meal, whether it be 15 minutes later or 45 minutes later or an hour later. You're fine. So don't rush unless you're hungry. If you're hungry, hey, go ahead and eat. But my point is, is don't listen when people say it has to be fast acting. It has to be liquid. You got to get it down right away. Um, it does help if you're fasted, but you've indicated you're not fasted. So that wouldn't apply to you. All right. Um, okay. How many, how many grams of tuna would you eat max in a week? <laughs> you try to make me think about my college days when all I ate was tuna. I actually never had any kind of mercury poisoning at all, which is the fear of tuna. Um, and, you know, we would eat, you know, five cans a day. Um, so they have different kinds of tuna now. I'm trying to think of the kind in the blue can. It's uh, no, this, it's not the it's not the star kiss one. There's um planet something planet wild planet tuna where it says it's troll caught. That means it's caught when it's smaller before it accumulates all the mercury and everything. It's a little more expensive, but that's a real high quality tuna. Um, you could probably eat as much of that as you want. The only time I ever had my mercury levels go up is when I was eating a lot of orange roughy. 
Um, cause orange roughy tastes really good. So there was one year I was eating a ton of orange roughy and my mercury levels actually, actually went, uh, went out of range. Uh, they were too high. So luckily I didn't use my hair, lose my hair and get headaches and all that stuff that you typically see. Um, all right, let's see. How many eggs is a good number to eat per day? Another one. Okay, that's a very, very controversial question. Um, first of all, I like to get eggs from a farm and um, where the chickens have been free to roam around and peck and get insects and worms and things like that. You'll notice the yolk will be much more yellow, even almost orange. The more orange it is, usually the more carotenes it has in it, more vitamin A precursor. Really, really good for you. Um you know, people are worried about the cholesterol in an egg, but the liver is a pretty amazing thing. If you eat more cholesterol, it makes less. If you eat less, it makes more. So I don't buy, I don't necessarily buy into the, you've got to eat no cholesterol diet unless you have some kind of um, medical reason to do that. And then, you know, you might want to be careful. But for most of us, you know, if you want to have some eggs every day, it's fine. Um, and actually whole eggs are part of what drive my HDL up. Uh, my HDL is pretty good. And whole eggs and, and uh, olive oil are two of the things that really, really help there. So I'm not going to give you a number because there is no perfect number. Um, I've got people that eat two eggs a day. I've got people that eat no eggs a day. I've got people that eat 12 eggs a day. And they all have pretty similar blood work. Okay, Jerry Fields, 20 years old, two years of lifting, 152 pounds, 12 to 15% body fat on an eight-week cut. Uh, couldn't see them two years ago at 8 to 10% body fat. If you couldn't see your abs at 8% body fat, you either weren't 8% body fat or your abs were not developed enough. They weren't dense enough. So continue the cut, defined abs. Um, well, you didn't say how tall you were. 152 pounds could be pretty big or it could be pretty small, depending on how big you are. Um, I don't know if you're training your abs though. If you're down to eight, if you get down eight percent body fat, you should be able to see the outline of your abs. It shouldn't just be nothing. Um, so I would be doing a lot of leg raises and incline sit ups. The leg raises for your lower abs, the incline sit ups more for your upper abs. Um, I, I don't. So that could be the problem again. You don't really see how tall you are. So if you're like six foot two and you're one fifty two, um, you need to gain some muscle. If you're five foot three and you're one fifty two then you probably got some good muscle on you. So, um, but anyways, if the rest of your body is really lean, but your abs don't show, it's probably, it's probably just your abs, the, the development. If you're not real lean all over and your abs don't show, then you're probably not really 8%. Mm -hmm. So um, I would need to know the rest of that before I could really um, answer with any kind of uh, uh, Rudy Zerati, keep it up. I like that little dancing emoji. That's pretty cool. All right. Mr. My Way, I sent a message above with a question about statins. All right. We're going to have to see if we can find that. We can't find it. Um, I tell you what, send me an email, Mr. My Way, to mountaindog1 at live.com, and I'll be happy to answer that question for you. Oh, actually, just yeah, just type it in again. Just type it in down here at the bottom because the messages are coming in so fast, it's really hard to keep up with them. Maybe there's a word in there that's stopping it. Okay. Yeah. We've got some word things set up, so if you say a word that we don't like, we, we stop it. We don't let it. Uh, okay, what is your latest pre-workout meal recommendation it really hasn't changed i still love a, a small to medium-sized meal i don't like big meals um, it also depends on how far out you are from the workout so if you're like say two hours away you want to have some steak and rice or steak and potato go for it but if you're more like 30 minutes away then you probably want to have a smaller meal that's easier to digest maybe you want to have a shake some oats or you can have my favorite. All you got to do is is uh, search on YouTube the concoction bowl, and you'll see the cream of rice, peanut butter, low low sugar, uh, chocolate syrup. That's the carb and fat combination. Then you have a scoop of protein powder with it. That's still my favorite. All right. Do I? Okay. Did, we, did another one come in? Okay. All right. Let's go.
Okay, sir. Okay. How? Okay, here's helmet. How should I distribute my fat intake for the day when I train right after waking up? How do you distribute fats, and is it common to add fats to meals? So there's this phobia that started somewhere from someone who's very uneducated saying that you can't combine carbs and fats. And what they were saying was carbohydrates trigger insulin release, which is true. So then if you have fat in your bloodstream, um, insulin also is, an, is, a, uh, is a transporter. So it drives things into cells. So if you have fat into your bloodstream, then it's going to drive that into your fat cells and they're going to get big and get really fat. So, for example, you should never have oatmeal with your, or you should never have peanut butter with your oatmeal because as you're combining a fat and a carb. That's absolutely horrible advice. And if you hear that from someone, run away. Terrible advice. Um, where the, whether you get leaner or fatter is more dependent on your caloric intake for the day. It has nothing to do with your macronutrients being combined, whether you're combining fat and carbs. If you don't believe me, um, just experiment a little bit and try it. And then the other thing I would say is I do like to have fat with carbs. And the reason why is you get a more steady insulin response. So fat slows down how quickly glucose gets in your bloodstream. So if you have a rush of glucose, hit your bloodstream fast, you trigger a lot of insulin. And a lot of insulin um, can make you feel crappy. Because if you have a lot of insulin, the goal of insulin is to drive your blood sugar down. Your blood sugar comes comes crashing down. You're going to get, it's called reactive hypoglycemia. So you'll get lightheaded. You'll start sweating, and it's a terrible feeling. You go hypo. That's the term that we use for it, to go hypo. And it's a terrible feeling. Now, what about around your work? You asked me specifically about around your, uh, you train, how should you distribute fast for after, this, after you wake up? So I would still, if you train fasted, um, I would probably, I would probably, use a faster acting um, meal post-workout because you're fasted. If you were not fasted, if you ate a little bit on the way to the gym and you had some intra, then it doesn't really matter if you have fat afterwards. And it, what's interesting is there were some studies too that people seem to have forgotten about. Everybody was talking about having just straight carbs uh, and protein after you train. There were some studies done with um, fat, adding fat, specifically whole milk, uh, instead of skim milk. And there was actually, I'm trying to remember if there was more, more protein synthesis or whether it was just more prolonged, but whatever it was, it, the, the result was positive from adding fat. So I would have fat in every, in every meal unless you're fasted and you got to get nutrients in you quickly. But even then you could probably debate me and have a really good case on, you know, it doesn't really matter that much. So don't overthink fat. Try to get about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 grams per kilogram, you know, um, as a bottom end of that. So if you are 100 kilograms and, you know, you'd want at least 50 grams of fat at least and probably even upwards of more than that. Um, no, let me, let, me, um, let me restate that. It's not kilograms. It's, it's pounds um, unless you're really, really overweight and obese. And then it's, I would go more toward lean pounds. So if you weigh 200 pounds, multiply that times 0 0.4 or 0 0.5. So you'd be somewhere on 80 grams of fat a day. That's generally puts you in a good, good range. Um, I have a pretty tough sedentary job. I pull my QL a couple times per day doing heavy deadlifts, any stretching or mobility for lower back. Yeah, QL, quadratus lumborum. Um, I pull mine a lot too, and in, mine's always doing dumb stuff like tying my shoe or just getting out of the groove in a lift. It could be bending over, picking up a 30-pound dumbbell. Once you, It seems like once you strain it, it just strains easier and easier. Um, so there's um, a couple things I would tell you to avoid, and that's don't stop training your lower back uh, at all because the tissue around it just gets weaker and you make it worse. I'd probably do some more core work. I would do more glute work. I would make sure your hamstrings are strong and flexible. I would work on your hand, your um, hip flexor mobility. So your uh, rectus femoris, everything on the front of your quad. Make sure it's flexible. If it's real tight, it, it has an effect on your lower back that's not good. Make sure your abs are strong so your lower back's not absorbing a lot. Um, and again, you know, you, you could put in some rotational work um, for obliques and core, but don't overdo it or you'll make it even worse. 
but um, basically strengthen up everything around it. I mentioned, oh, actually, I wasn't on this. I just did a video for you guys on evidence-based training, what I think about it. And I mentioned um, reverse hyperextension bench. Um, reverse hypers are really good for strengthening your spinal erectors. I also just did a video on Zercher uh, carries that will be out here in a week or two. Zercher carries are awesome for your upper spinal erectors. The more strength you can get around that area, the more your QL doesn't have to do everything by itself. So that's how I would approach it personally, Sergi. All right. Uh, Blake, tips for – what? Okay, we'll go back to it. Okay, Blake, tips for cutting if going on vacation for a week, eating out, drinking, want to enjoy myself. Well, I'm going on vacation next week. So um, cutting on vacation. I wouldn't want to starve myself and cut. Um, but if you, I assume you, want, you say you want to enjoy yourself. Well, then I would probably just have less meals. That's what I normally do. So I remember back when I was competing, I was religious on six meals a day, six meals a day without fail. And I did it for decades where I never missed a meal, six meals, except when I went on vacation, because I knew when I went on vacation, I wanted to have, you know, they had those buffets and stuff like that. So I would bracket, I would bring it down to three meals a day just so the calories weren't crazy. And usually what you find when you're on vacation is you walk a lot, you're out doing things, you're exploring, you're having fun. So you should be able, you know, when I came back from vacation, I was always lighter. And most of the time is after a show. I schedule my vacations for right after a show. And just from being active, um, that neat I was talking about earlier, about um, just being active through the day, um, was always that and cutting down to three meals, I would always lose weight. So I would come back smaller than after a show. Everybody else was showing their pictures after a contest. Look how big I am now. Look how much heavier I am. And I was actually smaller and, and I lost weight. Um, because I was so active and I had cut down to three meals and my th meals were like, you know, I'd have pecan pie. I would have margaritas. I'd have all kinds of stuff. So just cut your meal number down and stay active and you'll be able to have fun and you'll probably get a little bit leaner. Okay. Astronomy Philly, astronomy Philly. Uh, so if you're in Philly, I'm a big Eagles fan. Not sure we're going to have a good year coming up, but. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully they'll draft well, which has not been their strength. I I am not very happy with Howie Roseman right now. Just wanted to say you're looking healthy, and thanks for previous advice. Tendinitis, pain, all gone. Oh, cool. All right. Well, you're welcome. Um, thank you for your support. Uh, Martin. Hi, John. Hope you're doing well. How to beat the getting stronger, not bigger dilemma. So you want to get stronger, but not bigger. 5'9", 158, 27 years. Is my 500-calorie deficit the thief two years experience? Okay, so I guess you are getting stronger but not bigger. Um, I, th You know, if you're in a deficit, then, yeah, 500-calorie deficit, you're going to have a hard time growing. Now, I know people say you can be in a deficit and grow. But it's particularly if someone younger like yourself to lifting and you only got two years experience. Yes, it is possible, but a 500 calorie deficit isn't going to happen with a 500 calorie deficit. Not going to happen. You're going to have to, if you're going to want to get bigger, you're going to have to have a smaller caloric deficit. All right. Um, Dr. Hamza, what training program do you recommend for a non-athlete to do in the gym, long term, forever. The goal is to maintain or slow strength gains. Non-athlete. I don't have. Okay, I don't know what you mean by what do you recommend for a non-athlete. I assume you mean by a competitor. What is that noise? Can you guys hear that noise? What training program? Let me try this again. What training program do you recommend for a non-athlete to do in the gym long term? The goal is to maintain. Um, if you're talking about the programs that I'm selling, um, something you could do for fun. A lot of them are really high volume. They push you really hard. A lot of them are low volume, but they're really high intensity. So if you're just training for fun, I'd probably do the intermediate one. I'd probably do Warlock. It's upper, lower, upper, lower splits, four days a week. Um, it's not incredibly demanding. So I would probably err on the side of that one. Okay, Leon. 
Okay. Um, okay. I'm. I'll get to them. Guys. Okay, Paula. How many grams per kilogram of body mass of protein to eat per day? So I generally like somewhere around one gram per pound split up over your five meals. So if you weigh 150 pounds, 150 grams of protein. Um, that's assuming you have a fairly normal composition and you're not really obese. So um, per, per kilograms, I'm not sure what that works out to per kilogram, but just make it simple. Just figure out how many pounds you are, how much you weigh, and just do one and divide it by five would be the easy way to do that. That's plenty. If you're on really low carbs and low calories, you might want to bump that up to 1.25. But I'd rather see someone on a little bit higher carbs so they have a lot of energy, and you can do one gram. Okay. What's your opinion on ideal time for eccentrics? Ooh, that's a good question. How much can you employ advanced training techniques like cluster sets without overtraining? Well, in terms of overtraining, there's a lot of factors to play into that. So what are you doing for your intra workout nutrition? You know, I'm a fanatic on that. Um, essential aminos, cluster dextrin, my recovery product. Um, I am, I'm absolutely um, big, big, big on that. Um, pre and post workout meals and sleep, low stress, all those things that can contribute to recovery are really, really important. So if you're doing all that stuff, you can handle more. If you're not doing that stuff, if you're training fasted, if you're not getting sleep, if you're stressed out, then you can't handle more. So part of the answer to your question is how, are, what kind of state are you in in terms of nutrition and um, sleep and so forth. So when I think about like cluster sets and things like that, I think about maybe two of those a workout, like one on each, one on two different exercises, like the really high intensity sets, really it's just wrapping up an exercise with one of them, except for a compound movement that's more, maybe more dangerous, like a squat. Like I probably wouldn't want to do something like that on a squat. Um, and the ideal time for eccentrics. Well, eccentrics certainly have their place. I would always, I would tell you that if you simply control the eccentric phase, generally that's what you need. If you're talking about overloading eccentrics and you want to go heavy and have someone help you with the positive part of the rep, that's a very demanding high intensity technique in itself. Like let's say you're doing leg curls and you, you're using a really heavy weight, so someone's helping you get the weight up but then you're lowering the weight slowly because it's really, really heavy, more than you can do concentrically. That's, I would put that in the same class as cluster sets, drop sets, very demanding. Probably only want to do one or two of those a workout. All right, my meal plan is a caloric deficit. It's low carbs, high protein, and fat. Is a red meat good? Have one of your meals because it's high. All right, it just scrolled up so fast I couldn't. It is a low carb, high protein, and fat. Is a red meat good? Have one of your meals because it's high in fats and give you. Okay, I think what you're saying is, is a red meat meal good because it has fats in it? It's high protein. Um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I would say um, I like. You know, people can argue with me on this, but I do like grass fed cuts. I do like animals that are grass fed. Um. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, and if you're, particularly if you're in a caloric deficit, sometimes red meat actually makes you feel a lot better. You get some iron and things like that. But you're 6'1", you're 185, and your, your, your goal is to lose fat and to gain muscle. All right, well, I would say if you're 6'1 and 185, I would focus more on gaining a little bit of muscle personally, if, especially if you're under 15% body fat. If you were 20, 25% body fat, I would say no, get leaner. Um, anyways, so I hope that helps a little bit. But yeah, man, go ahead, have the red meat meals. Nothing wrong with that. And red meat usually digests pretty easy for most people too. Red meat actually usually digests better than chicken. Um, and the fat that's in it, if you look it up, most red meat, the fat is actually a little bit more monounsaturated than it is saturated. So that's another misnomer people have. Well, it's all saturated fat. No, it's not. 
Uh, do the research on it, and you'll see that it's actually a little bit, most cuts are actually a little bit more monounsaturated fat, uh, which is considered heart healthy. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, Mr. My Way. Ah, there it is. What's your opinion on the effects of taking a statin and building muscle towards your genetic limit? That's a great question. So there's several different things that can happen here. Like if you're on a statin, you can have terrible side effects, your joint pain, muscle pain. Those are real. Those happen as a result of statins. Now, <clears throat> a lot of the problem can be, I think, partially alleviated by CoQ10 or ubiquinol. Um, that's the, there's the, 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 the pathway that gets blocked from statins has a very negative impact on CoQ10 levels in your body. So that's why they tell you to supplement with CoQ10, you know, 200 milligrams or something like that. I'll be real honest with you. I take 600 milligrams a day of ubiquinol. Ubiquinol is just the reduced form of CoQ10. So it's just a little bit easier to absorb. Doesn't mean CoQ10 doesn't work. I'm not saying that. It's just think of it like ALA and RALA. RALA is the reduced form. It's just a little bit easier to uh, absorb. Ubiquinol is the same thing. It's just a little bit easier to absorb than um, um, CoQ10. So what I have found with people, and I just had a couple of my friends try this that are on a really low dose statin. I had them add in 600 mgs of, co- of ubiquinol and three, and three grams of L-carnitine, and they're actually stronger and their stamina is better, which is what I found. So um, I don't, it depends on your dose too. Like if you're taking 40 milligrams of Lipitor versus 10 milligrams of Lipitor, like 40 milligrams is obviously going to be a, potentially a lot more side effects but the people I know that take a small dose of it, they don't really have that many side effects as long as they're taking their CoQ10 and things like that. Um, statin, the you know the way statins work. I wish Doctor Serrano was here to to talk to you about it. It's it's an it's a it controls inflammation in the blood vessels. Um, you know, it's not what people think. It's not really the the reduction in cholesterol that that it seems to be helping with lifespan and prevention of heart attacks and things like that. Um, so anyways, um, I think if you're going to take a statin, you know, first of all, talk to a doctor, although the doctors now, a lot of them are just trained on give people statins. Statins, the last time I checked, were the number one selling drug in the world. Uh, that could be different. That's the last time I checked. I'm pretty sure like Lipitor was up there in the billions of dollars. Most doctors get kickbacks. So you got to be really, really, really careful about this kind of stuff. There's a lot of negative evidence on statins too. So um, just be careful. Um, can you answer my two questions above about bulking with Crohn's? Okay, I got to find those, Kerbo. Um, are they, Kerbo, are they in the questions on the right? Okay, we're going to look for those right now while I move on. I have uh, my helpers here. Give me a hand. Okay. Let's see. Leon's the next one. Blake, Paula, Jay, uh, My Way, Kerbo, Martin. Sorry. Uh, th- okay, John, I love your videos. Thoughts on ab training. What is the most effective number of days to do core training? I think two or three days a week is plenty. I I like to do like a more of a lower ab focus day and then more of an upper ab focus day. You don't have to do that. Um, but, you know, my I might do a movement, one movement. And usually when I do abs, it's one movement. I would do one movement, like say leg raises uh, done where you keep your knees bent and you're locked in an L so it's not as much hip flexor where you just kind of roll up into a ball. And then the next ab workout, I might do five or six sets of – incline sit-ups which is a little bit more upper abs um and then i actually like doing some transverse abdominus training um if you look on my youtube it's called pull down crunches i think it's where i have a i'm holding a lat pull down and i'm breathing i'm i'm inhaling in sucking in my stomach and then i'm crunching down with the weight i'm holding but i think um i think three days is plenty and when I hear when I hear core, I also it's a lot more than abs. It's your glutes, it's your lower back, it's your QL, it's your spinal erectors. Um, so not just abs. I would make sure you're working your glutes. Make sure you're working your spinal erectors. People people just don't um, 
train their lower back is I don't think they train it enough anymore directly. They think, well, it's enough just to do squats or whatever. Man, I had my best strength gains when I was at West Side Barbell doing tons of reverse hypers. My strength skyrocketed up. My lower back felt like steel. So <clears throat> any advice on CrossFit? Um, I'm not a CrossFit expert. The problem I have with CrossFit is doing highly technical movements while under a fatigue condition. So if you're doing something like, say, a power clean and then pressing overhead, uh, that's something to me that requires very precise technique. And if you're doing it for time or reps and you're fatigued and you start to use bad form, that's how people get hurt. So my advice on CrossFit would be I understand it's competitive and you like to beat your own records and beat other people's records. But when your form is compromised, you need to really think about stopping the set. I, I would not advise you to do a lot of sets with terrible form. That's the problem I have with CrossFit. I think if you control your form, and it's great. It can push you hard. You can get in much better shape. I've got friends that do CrossFit. They're in great shape, but they don't get sloppy with their form. They're very, very meticulous about their form. Um, okay, so let's go down. I see Rajneesh has a question, but I don't see it. YouTuber. YouTuber. Okay, feel RDL way too much in lower back no matter what I do. Lighten the weight, change barbell to dumbbell, kettlebell. My lower back always takes over. Well, an RDL is supposed to train your lower back. Um, I'm not sure what you, you – like. that's like telling me you feel a squat too much in your quads or you feel a curl too much in your biceps. An RDL is a lot of lower back. So if you're not trying to train your lower back, then I'm assuming you want to train your hamstrings. So if you want to train your hamstrings um, – don't bend your knees so much. Just a teeny tiny bend. And don't even really bend at your waist or don't even bend over at your lower back. Just shoot your hips back. So keep your legs pretty close to locked, just barely not locked. Move your hips back so you feel your hamstring stretching. Keep your back flat. Don't bend over. Don't round over. So just move your hips back and feel your hamstring stretching. Uh, instead of doing an RDL. Now, the RDL, I really like it for glutes, though. You get a lot of glute action. You're stretching your glute. You're working your lower back. You are getting your hamstrings. So I'm assuming your question is that you just don't feel it in your hamstrings, and maybe you're trying to do it for your hamstrings. That's the only thing I can figure what you're saying here. So I would change my form then. I wouldn't make it more. I would make it more of a stiff-legged deadlift than, art, than a remaining deadlift is what I would do. So I hopefully hopefully that's what you were uh, asking. Um, bison versus beef. I don't really have a preference either way. A lot of people prefer bison. Bison. I mean, it depends on how the animals were um, fed and the conditions they were in. I certainly don't like. I certainly wouldn't compare good bison to the hamburger meat you get at McDonald's. I think there's a difference in quality there. But if you're getting high quality beef, I used to get mine from a farmer. I got Red Angus. The beef was amazing. It was awesome. It was grass fed. So I would just make sure if, whichever source you're getting, just try to find out how the animal was raised. And I would go with that to make the determination. Beef can be, you know, like I said, it can be a really nice, good cut, or it can be hamburger meat you get at McDonald's. And there is a difference. Okay, let's see. Which one? Rajnes? Okay, how to get stronger. So... um the ideal thing is to, uh, I would probably, you sound like a beginner, so what I would do is keep a logbook and write down the lifts, and I would each week try to improve your lift by maybe two pounds or five pounds, or try to add a couple repetitions. So if you do 100 pounds for 10 reps, the next week try to do it for 11 reps. Or if you do 100 pounds for 10 reps, try to do 105 pounds for 10 reps. Be very meticulous about um, getting a little bit stronger with the weight lifted or the amount of repetitions that you do would be my primary focus and work on that for a couple years. If you're new, you should have no problem gaining strength or reps. Um, your neurological adaptations to training will help you do that. So, um, you know, you should, as long as you're eating, if you're eating like crap, then you're not going to get good results. So, Take care of your diet and focus on that logbook and beating your numbers by a little bit each week as a beginner should get you where you should see really good results that way. Um, oh, no. No. Yeah, it says YouTube not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. 
As such, viewers will experience buffering. Oh, boy. Is that our network here? Or is it YouTube? It's a network here? Okay. Um, all right. Can you guys tell me real quick? I'm getting this notification that YouTube's having trouble streaming. Can you guys tell me? Are you still hearing everything okay? Um. I see the comments coming in on the right-hand side just fine. Would you recommend a Smith machine squat? I'm a beginner, but my gym has no squat rack, and the Smith machine feels strange. I'm scared of hurting myself. I would not put a beginner in a Smith machine to do squats. I personally like Smith machine squats, but I would not have a beginner do it. You have to have your body set in the right position to squat in a Smith machine. You have to have your feet out in front of you at a certain length. You gotta have your back a certain way. You have to drop into your squat a certain way. I would not do that. I um I would recommend you do something like a deadlift, a standard deadlift, or a trap bar deadlift. Uh, kind of kind of simulates a squat. Kind of. Um, you could do dumbbell squats. You could do um look up my dumbbell squats on my YouTube where I have two um uh, um aerobic step benches and I'm dropping a dumbbell in between them to get a good range of motion. I would do all that before I would do a Smith squat. Smith squats are for way more down the road when you really understand mechanics because you will absolutely destroy your knees if you don't know how to squat in the Smith machine and you try to simulate how you do it with a barbell. You'll, you'll tear your knees up and it'll happen quick. Okay. I am Kerbo. We don't see your question, so um, feel free to email me at mountaindog1 at live.com, and I'll answer it for you directly. Um, best way to add mass to the chest? Well, I like small angles. I like small declines and small inclines. I think those, if you do a small decline, you'll notice zero stress on your shoulders, which I love. And a small incline, I feel like you really are opening up your chest a lot. Now, it also depends on that angle your elbow is traveling at. I assume you guys have all seen the Instagram video of uh, the guy tearing his pec. Um, now, I'm not saying that was his form, but you do put yourself at a high risk for a pec tear when you're letting your elbows kind of uh, ride up really high. I'd rather see someone maybe not tucked into their side and make it a tricep exercise, but somewhere in between. Um, and then um, also, I would, have, I would encourage you to do more dumbbell work and then do your barbell work. Uh, you'll notice it's a little bit less stress when your joints get a little bit more muscle action too. Uh, okay. If you could have five health-based supplements, which would you choose? Ooh, good question. Affordable. Well, you just killed my first one, ubiquinol. That'd be easily my number one, but it's not cheap. Um, I would say health supplements, ubiquinol would be easily be number one. I would say fish oil. A uh, high EPA DHA fish oil would be on my list for sure. So many benefits. Vitamin D3 would be on my list. Um, if you live in a non-tropical climate and you're a pale white skin like I am, you probably have your vitamin D levels are too low. Vitamin D, fish oil, ubiquinol would easily be my top three. And then beyond that, it gets kind of, you know, probably curcumin would be really good because it manages inflammation levels in your body. That might be number four. And number five, it might be, let's see, number five would be, I'm going to say, um, I'm not sure because after that, everything is just kind of a jumble. Um, I actually like I actually like an ingredient that's in our non-stem pump. It's called VasoDrive. If you look it up, it's on the maypro.com website. It's an ingredient called lactotripeptides, and it actually keeps your blood vessels dilated, and it actually helps people with their blood pressure. <laughs> um, and it, it helps give you a crazy pump. Um, not many people know about it, but it's phenomenal. So I think you can actually buy it by itself. I use it, in the, in the, in our, again, in our non-stem pump. Okay, let's see. What strategy would you use on training days when you cannot apply progressive overload, not because of fatigue, but because the body just not does not want to work or deload? 
Um, today was one of those days for me. I was very excited. I couldn't wait to get in and do legs. I had in my mind what I wanted to do on the pro squat machine that Rogers makes. I didn't get to it. I just didn't have it in me today. Um, when you have days like that, just get in there um, and just put some work in. Don't worry about going to failure. Maybe just do a little bit more volume. If you don't have it, you don't have it. The main thing is that you just get in there. So don't overthink that one. Just get in there and get some work in. And don't worry about not setting any records. I'd rather have somebody that never misses a workout and they train pretty hard as opposed to someone who goes crazy, then they miss a week, then they go hard for a week, then they miss a week. The consistency is what's really going to help you more in the long run, okay? Um, RJ Bizzle, what would you recommend for building strength on the bench press for more intermediate and advanced lifters? It's always been my weak lift. I would do a ton of four presses. I was just talking to Dave Tate about this, and Dave certainly is more of an expert than me. So a ton of floor presses. Um, and on the, uh, the floor presses, I would also do a lot of heavy tricep work. Floor presses themselves are really good for your triceps. I would also do more dynamic work. We kind of got away from that. You're going to see that in a new training program that Dave and I are going to launch here pretty soon in a couple of weeks. Those are lighter, <clears throat> 55, 60, 65% of your one rep max for low reps. They're done explosively to teach your body how to generate force quickly. Uh, I love that's where we learned that from Louie. That's what Louie was doing. I would like that. I like that kind of bench work. Um, and again, we like the floor presses. I actually like um, <clears throat> high incline Smith presses, actually. So you get in a Smith machine and you set it at a really high incline. And then you lower the bar in front of you to about your chin and drive it up. And one of the things Dave and I like to do as well is we like to hold at the top. So we might hold the weight before we start to set. And then when we finish with our last rep, we'll hold again. Just get the body used to stabilizing and holding the heavy weight. Those are a couple of things that we do that I think really is, is going to help. And those are all actually in that new Power Builder program. Um, again, probably going to be a couple of weeks for that. Okay, Kathy, I'm on your Omega Sentinel program and getting stronger every week, but I only do three workouts per week because I also have to take three to four ballet classes. Do you think I'll regress and lose muscle mass? Well, I mean, if it's working right now and you're getting stronger, Kathy, you're not losing muscle. If you were losing muscle, you'd lose strength. So it's definitely working. Keep it up. Um, maybe the three workouts per week is actually just the right amount for you given, given what you're doing with your ballet. So for you, that might actually be perfect. So keep up the good work. But no, if you're getting stronger every week, you're not, you're not losing muscle. If you were losing muscle, muscle produces force. The less muscle you have, the less force you can produce. So you would be, if you're losing muscle, you'd be getting weaker. So good job. Always, uh, and by the way, we're working on a, a, a woman's program too. It's more wellness driven. It's more lower body driven. Um, we're probably about six weeks away from having that out. Okay, what else? Am I missing any more here, Noah? Okay, I'm missing one here. Let me find it real quick. Which one is it? Uh, who who sent it in? Okay, I just saw that one. Follow up. Oh, fo follow up. Why bodybuilders eat dry, lean, low-fat chicken breast, not thighs, but higher-fat red meat? Do you also add fat when having higher-fat protein sources? What fat do you add to meals? So if I'm going to add fats, I like avocados. I like different kinds of nuts, like macadamia nuts, good for monounsaturated fat. Almonds are good for monounsaturated fat. Um, Brazil nuts are, like, good for selenium. And by the way, you can eat selenium if, you, if you're worried about getting mercury poisoning. You can have some Brazil nuts with your tuna. It binds to mercury. You don't have to worry about getting mercury poisoning. Um, I have no problem if someone wants to eat thighs instead of chicken breast. I have no problem with that at all. I don't have any issues with the extra fat. If it's within your macros and your calories, I have no issues with that at all. Higher fat red meat, <clears throat> I have no issues with that at all. Again, I just prefer it come from a good source. Um, and the same thing with um, with um, chickens. You know, chickens are a little bit tougher. Chickens is... It's hard because they'll label free range, but is it really free range? Because just because they give them access to the outside, do they really go outside? So the chicken one's tricky. So what I try to do is just get them from a farm, um, which is not easy. It's a lot easier around here to get eggs from a farm. But if you want to eat chicken thighs, 
fine. If you want to eat higher fat red meat, fine. Just make sure it's within your um, allotted calories and macronutrient, and, and you're fine. So um, what fat do I add to meals? Nut butters. Also add maybe almond butter, peanut butter, um, avocado I mentioned, um, nuts I mentioned. Those are probably my primary ways to add fat to meals. All right. We've got about five minutes, and I'm going to have two more come in. Okay, Sleeping Forest, my my meal plan at a calorie deficit, or is that it, or is it another one? Okay, me again, what's your advice on a meal plan? What was the rest of it? On a meal plan? Okay. Okay. Um, you're not going to get fat. It's just calories. Like you're not going to get fat if you're in a slight surplus and it'll allow you to gain muscle. So if you think you're at say 3000 calories is what you are maintenance, then try 3,200 or 3,300. Don't go straight to 4,000. Um, you should not get, you should not get fat as long as the, the surplus is small. Um, and the surplus should allow you to continue to gain muscle. Okay, so um, again, incorporating red meals without getting fat. There's nothing magical about red meat that makes you fat. It's just eating too many calories is what makes you fat. So don't be afraid that the red meat's going to make you fat. If you go to 85 lean, 15% fat ground beef, and you start eating a ton of that, yeah, your calories might skyrocket. 15% fat, 15 fat is a lot of calories. It's not because of the fat. It's because the calories are going to be so high. Six ounces of that versus six ounces of 90, 90, 93, 7 lean is a huge difference in calories. So, um, it's again, it's just about your calories. Okay, my, lo- my left bicep doesn't pump like my right one. Can you suggest something for me to fix it? Um, I mean, I'm sure everybody's telling you to do unilateral work, train each arm, one arm at a time, which is the first thing I would tell you as well. Um, if, if your right arm is getting really good pump, but your left arm doesn't, maybe you have some kind of nerve impingement. Um, maybe you have, maybe you need ART active release technique. Maybe you've got some tissue that's bound up. that's causing some issues in your forearm. Maybe you want to get it checked around your elbows. That could be causing some issues. Um, if you got, I mean, if you if your right arm is pumping up really good, then your form must be pretty good. So it's probably not something with form. It's probably something physiological, like uh, maybe some nerve problems or scar tissue or something like that. So I would go to get some ART done. Man, that'd be my best guess. Get some ART done, active release technique. Have them work on that left arm. Have them work all around your elbow. Tell me you want them to work on your supinator. Tell me you want to work on your extensors, your flexors, and your forearms. Tell me you want to work on your biceps as well. I get a lot of ART done on my biceps as just as a part of my deep tissue work. And my bicep tissue seems to be really, really healthy. So I'll give that one a shot. Okay, one more. Uh, who wrote it? UG, it's at the bottom. I can't quite see it yet. Should I eat at maintenance calories on a rest day while I'm balking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go maintenance and then save the um, – if you have trouble gaining weight, you could do two things. You could either add more calories to your training days or you could start to train – or you could start to add more calories to your resting days. I tend to favor adding more calories to your training days. I know a lot of people say, well, the next day is when your muscle is really repairing – Absolutely, it is, but you can get a big jump start on it by having more food around your workout on training days. You can; It makes a much bigger difference adding in calories around your training versus the next day. That's my opinion on that one. So, um, okay, is that everything? Am I caught up? All right, guys. Well, um, we're going to wrap it up. Alexander's going to do some yo-yo tricks here. Um, if you... Um, Want to remember, if those of you who are new to uh, Granite Supplements, if you want to try Granite Supplements, remember there's a 
Nice code, Granite Strong 25, capital G, capital S, one word, Granite Strong 25. Um, please try our supplements, unbelievable supplements, granitesupplements.com. I'd love to get any support from you. We've got a lot of new products coming too. We've got a fish oil coming. We have a collagen coming. We have plant protein coming. We have, uh, what did we work on yesterday? Yesterday was an immune system strengthener. So we don't just have all the bodybuilding stuff. We also have some health stuff coming on the way too, which I think will well really round out our products nicely. So anyways, I know everybody wants to see Alexander do some yo-yo tricks. It's been a little while since you've seen him. So uh, get ready to have your mind blown. He's getting really good at this stuff. Hopefully it's not, um, hopefully it's showing, it's just spinning on my computer. Just, there it goes, there it goes, now you're good, now you're good. You got a magic glove now? Did you just go under your legs? Did you just go under your legs? Yeah. Man. Keep going, man. This is amazing. <laughs> People are liking it. Keep it going, man. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Alexander. We'll see you all next time.